Now I have two discs here that are held together by four bolts. Now they're exactly the same mass. The only difference is how the bolts are distributed. Now my question to you is, if I roll these down the ramp, which one is gonna win the race? Or will it be a tie? They start from the same height, so shouldn't they have the same final velocity at the end because of the conservation of energy? Let's see, shall we? Well, clearly the red one, but why is that? Well, it's all about moment of inertia. So how do we explain moment of inertia? Now, in order to do this, we need to consider the energy of the objects that is undergoing rotation. Now, when an object is moving translationally, that is, it's moving from point A to point B, then we generally talk about the object's kinetic energy in terms of K is equal to one half mv squared. Of course, v is the velocity of the object and m is the mass. Now, this mass is independent of its shape. In other words, it doesn't matter what shape this object is, and we generally refer to the object's center of mass anyway. But what about if an object is undergoing circular motion? There, it's not just the mass that is important, but also how far that mass is away from its axis of rotation. So let's have a simple illustration. I have a bicycle wheel here that I'm about to rotate. But before we start, I'm going to place two of these masses onto the wheel, and then I'm going to rotate it. So as you can see now, I have two masses towards the center of the axis of rotation. Now, if I were to rotate this, it has a certain amount of kinetic energy based on the mass of the wheel that's rotating, but significantly, these two masses are contributing to the overall kinetic energy of the wheel. And of course, that's because these particular masses have a certain linear velocity based on obviously their angular velocity and of course their individual radii. But what would happen if I move these masses to the edges? So now the masses are at the edges. And even though we may have the same constant angular velocity, the linear velocity of each of these masses is greater, which means that their kinetic energy is greater. So even though the overall mass of the wheel hasn't changed, the total kinetic energy of the wheel has simply by moving the masses towards the edge. So let's start off by taking one particle of my object that is undergoing rotation and work out its kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy equals a half, mi being our particle. We have its velocity and we square it like so. But because it's undergoing rotation, what we can do is we can convert this to an angular velocity. Since v equals r omega, what we end up getting is one half mi ri omega squared, and the r is squared as well. Now that is one particle. So if my object is made up of a multitude of particles, the total kinetic energy, kt, will simply equal one half. Let's say we have m1, r1 squared, multiplied by omega squared, and then we have another particle, and we call this m2, r2 squared, omega squared, plus one half m3 r3 squared omega squared and so forth. So in other words, what we can really say is that the total kinetic energy is equal to the sum of one half m i, of course we're dealing here with all the i's here, r i squared omega squared. But what you can see here is that we have something that is constant. All these particles have the same angular velocity, and of course the half is also constant. So what we can say now is what we have is a half, the sum of m i r i squared multiplied by omega squared. So this here is called the moment of inertia. And so what we can say is the kinetic energy of an object that is rotating is equal to one half I, which is a moment of inertia, omega squared. Now our unit will be basically the unit that we have here. So we have kilogram meters squared as a unit for our moment of inertia. Kilogram meters squared 
Now obviously, to determine your moment of inertia, you need to break your particle down into its constituents to work out the actual value for your moment of inertia. For irregular objects, that could be quite challenging. Fortunately, we have the moment of inertia for regular objects. For example, let's say we have this rod here that has a certain length, like so. And we rotate it about the axis around here. So in other words, it's rotating around this axis. In this case, the moment of inertia is 1 12th multiplied by the mass of the rod multiplied by the length squared. Now what if I have the same rod, again the same length, so this length here is L, but this time we're rotating it about this axis. In this case, the moment of inertia, I, is equal to one third multiplied by the mass of the rod multiplied by the length squared. What about some sort of rectangular prism? Now here you can see I have a rectangle. It actually is a rectangular prism and its thickness in this direction has no bearing on it. But it has a certain length that we'll call A over this way and a certain width over here that we'll call B. In this case, the moment of inertia, if we are basically going to do the center of axis around the center of that, then the moment of inertia here is equal to 1 12th multiplied by the mass and then multiplied by a squared plus b squared. Now if I take the same mass and this time I end up rotating it about this axis like so, what happens now is that the moment of inertia here, and again this is A over here and this is B, in this case B is not important and the moment of inertia is equal to one third times the mass times A squared. Now taking, for example, cylinders that, for example, our demonstration earlier is actually represented as. So we basically have three cylinders. We have a solid one and two cylinders that are hollow, one whose outside is particularly thin and one that has a certain amount of thickness here. In the case of the first cylinder, the moment of inertia is equal to one half times mr squared. The one here where the, it's hollow, the moment of inertia is simply equal to mr squared. And then finally, if we've got a fair bit of thickness in the actual hollow cylinder, the value of i is equal to one half m. And now what we have is r1 squared plus r2 squared as a result. And then finally, we have spheres. And in this case, we're rotating it around the center of axis. And in the case of a sphere that is solid, the moment of inertia is equal to two fifths mass times the radius squared. Whereas a hollow sphere, it's going to be, the moment of inertia is going to be equal to two thirds mr squared. Now the question you may be asking is, how are those determined? Well stay tuned, I will produce another video where I will show the derivations of a number of these common shapes and how they are derived from first principles. So now let's go back to the race that we saw at the beginning of the video. Let's explain why we get the results. As we have established, the black one with the masses closer to the edge has a greater moment of inertia and therefore has a greater rotational kinetic energy. However, there is another form of kinetic energy. And the fact is, is that both objects are not only rolling, but moving translationally from left to right. That is, they both have translational kinetic energy, which is simply our half mv squared. Now they both start with the same gravitational potential energy based on their common height. They both end up having the same total kinetic energy down the bottom of the ramp. But as I've stated, there are the two types, the rotational and the translational type of kinetic energy. Now considering the black one has a greater rotational kinetic energy because of conservation of energy, it therefore must have less translational kinetic energy. And as a result, the final velocity is going to be less. And as a result, the time to take to get to the bottom of the ramp will have to be greater. Now finally, I do want to acknowledge Bruce Yaney for this particular concept of demonstrating moment of inertia. I hope that has been helpful for your understanding of the moment of inertia.
please like, share and subscribe and please put a comment down below if this has been helpful for you and don't forget to ring the bell so that you get my latest updates. And I really value your support by buying me a coffee. The link is in the description below. My name is Paul from Physics High. Bye for now.